Now, interestingly, if we begin to apply this to history, there's some interesting observations I want to show you. Virtually every great religious tradition, not all, but virtually every great religious tradition came about during the same period of history, between 600 to 400 BC, about 500 years before Jesus. This is referred to in history now by the, as the axial period, the, a, a, a time in history around which history changed. History turned. Right? This term, the axial period of history, came from the work of Karl Jaspers, a philosopher and historian. Actually, a philosopher of history. Jaspers, in his book, The Origin and Goal of History, said the axis of history, the turning point, the central point around which the world turned, is to be found in the period around 500 BC. Man as we know him today came into being. In this age were born the fundamental categories within which we still think today. That's the philosophies that developed. And also the beginnings of the world's religions. Take a look. Take a look at the religious beginnings. At the very time when Israel was preparing for Jesus and prophets were announcing the coming of the Messiah, in the 5th century before Christ, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi, at the very same time, Socrates was teaching in Greece. Socrates' primary student, his, uh, his main student was whom? Plato. Plato. And Socrates' words are only recorded by Plato, Plato's memory of what Socrates said. But Plato wrote so many things about the, f the, the, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, the Republic. Anyone read The Republic? And he talks about the idea of a philosopher king. And also the allegory of the, the idea of a spiritually enlightened person who rules and establishes a kingdom. Not unlike the kingdom of heaven or an ideal and good society. Also, the, uh, Plato's allegory of the caves refers to, um, it's a story that refers to, uh, without going into all the detail, the fact that humanity lives in darkness. And what we think is reality is like people looking at shadows on the wall of a cave because the light's behind them. And when someone who comes from the real world and sees the world as it is comes in and tries to convince people that what they're seeing is not reality, that the world is so much more, what will they do? They will reject him and struggle with him. And of course, Socrates was accused of brainwashing youth, poisoning the minds of young people. And he was forced to take poison. He was put to death. Plato's main student was who? Aristotle. Aristotle's main student was who? Alexander, who became Alexander the Great. And it was Alexander who, coming from this tradition, created, conquered the world, created an empire, and then gave religious freedom to the entire empire, which made it possible for Jesus to practice his faith and teach others in the Roman Empire 500 years later. This is not accident. At the very same time, this is, this is uh, Alexander's empire. Actually, it was much more far-reaching than that. But that was actually, that's the Greek empire before Alexander. But if we look in Asia, again in the 5th, 6th to 5th century BC, Buddha came. Again, a reform movement to reform the traditional Hinduism and create new insight. And, you know, Buddha wasn't concerned about the question of whether God existed or not. It wasn't a relevant question from his point of view. The transformation of our own way of managing ourselves and looking at the world was what Buddha focused on. At the very same time, Confucius, Kung Fu Tzu, Lao Tzu also, brought about a tremendous transformation and, and talked about an ideal society through five right relationships, which I'll refer to again. All of this timing was exactly the same. The axial period, this is what Jaspers was talking about, the fundamental religions, the major religions that we're aware of, and also the philosophical ways in which we think were born during that period. Also science and democracy and architecture and a tremendous development of knowledge and information, more, developing more rapidly than any time before it in history. And there's been no time since until when? 
until the last 500 years. I'm telling you the truth. Okay, it's very obvious. But let's look at this period a little bit more carefully. You have Malachi and Ezra, te Ezra teaching in the 5th century before Christ, preparing for Jesus. You have Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Greek civilization and culture, you have Buddha and Confucius. Now, something that's very interesting. If you look at the teaching of Buddhism, the very, very strong emphasis on the first blessing. What's the first blessing? Hmm? Individual unity between mind and body. Individual self-mastery. And if you want to get some strength, I'm, I'm, I'm a real proponent of utilizing wonderful traditions, religious traditions. And I'm a big fan of Buddhism, as is Reverend Moon's youngest son, who became a Buddhist. And he said he thought his father would uh, beat him up and be mad. But his father encouraged him and said, if you're going to do it, here's how to do it. Do it with your whole heart. And his father's love and, and, and acceptance and support eventually led him to realize and he became the number one proponent of his father's tradition through that process. Right? So Buddhism is, emphasizes personal self-mastery and right thinking and enlightenment and the balance between mind and body. What, which one of these traditions is, has a strong emphasis on the second blessing, creating Good family as a basis for a moral society. Confucianism. Confucianism, absolutely. Five right relationships, which are leader and people, you know, king and subjects, husband and wife, father and son or parent and child, and a few others. Elder and younger, elder and younger brother. By right relationships to create a good society. And which of these traditions emphasizes the third blessing? Mastery over the environment. It's absolutely Greek culture. Together with, the, uh, with Greek philosophy came a society that focused on life in the world, not for the next world, on how to master life in the world. So the Greeks were incredibly responsible for developments in science, developments in medicine, Hippocrates, developments in mathematics, right? Pythagoras. You could just go on and on and on. Democracy, ideas of all of the tools to make this a good world externally. And Greece focused on that because they weren't concerned about the next world. They had a fatalistic view. And Greek philosophy led, the, led that culture to focus on life in the world. So I see a different emphasis on each aspect that would need to be tied together by the Messiah. Very simple from my, my, my perspective. Just a suggestion. <laughs> also Rome was part of that, that the Greco-Roman civilization. Also, Roman Greece connected the world with roads and ships. And in conquering the world, they allowed religious freedom in all of their territories. Creating the possibility for a message and a, and, and, and a value system and a tradition to be spread to all of humanity. Perhaps it was a foundation for someone who was to come to teach us that God is our parent. To teach us how to pray, our Father who art in heaven. To recognize that love and grace and forgiveness and unconditional care and concern is the essence of God's nature. These are, these are examples of some of the roads that had been built. Actually, Rome had built roads throughout China, to the gates of China and all throughout China. And Roman ships traveled the world. And Jesus was born in the Roman Empire under a time of religious freedom. And the belief of the Israelites was that the Messiah would come to conquer Rome. And Jesus did come to conquer Rome, but not with violence and military power, but with love and truth. And even though he was crucified and crushed under the heel of the Roman Empire, 400 years later, Rome bowed to Jesus and Christianity became the official state religion of Rome. What was Jesus' goal and purpose in coming? What was Jesus trying to accomplish? He clearly proclaimed, he never proclaimed, kill me. He clearly proclaimed, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's imminent. Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
He taught how to pray. He gave the exemplary prayer for all of his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, starting with our Father. And then, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth. On earth. The earthly establishment of God's kingdom. On earth as it is in heaven. This, the purpose and mission of Jesus. Yes, came for the purpose of salvation, but let me ask you, you know, there are those who are grateful that Jesus paid a price in order to provide grace for our sins and suffering. But is salvation the forgiveness of sin? Let me think, let's think about that together. When we're forgiven of our sin, are we truly saved? Think about it. If a man is drowning in the water, and he's going under for the third time, and he says, help, help, save me, save me. What do you do? Do you run to the edge of the water and say, I forgive you for falling in? <laughs> Does that save him? No. The only way you can ultimately save the man is to bring him out of the water and back to where he was before he fell in, to restore his position on dry land. What if a, a man is dying of a disease? What's the doctor going to do? To save the man's life, someone is dying of a disease, to save their life is not a matter of forgiving the sickness, it's a matter of restoring health. So, please understand, the principle has no intention to undermine the significance of Jesus giving his life for humanity. And yet, that is not the intended purpose for which he came. And that's clear in the scripture. If you simply open up and read what's there, not, not people's interpretations and doctrines and dogmas, and not just what Philip Shanker is saying. <clears throat> Salvation is more than the forgiveness of sin, it's restoration, restoring our original nature. And Jesus proclaimed it. Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, not a period or an asterisk or the tiniest thing will get around the law until everything is accomplished. Everything spoken by the mouths of the prophets since the world began, the scripture says. The first blessing, the original purpose and plan of God, are, we, we, we maintain, is for individuals to grow to maturity to become one with God in heart. The most important aspect of a true son or daughter of God is not discipline, self-control, goodness. These are all nice, important things, but the most important thing is to resonate with the heart of the parent. Actually, in the principle, it says that a person who was truly mature and connected to God could not sin because it would hurt God. Could not violate because it would hurt too much. So it's about the heart. And so Jesus' central message that God is our parent. And Jesus' teaching that unless you become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you can humbly recognize and receive God's love, then getting to that, it's not just our effort and our struggle and our external accomplishment, but it's our capacity to love. It's also about consistency between words and actions. Jesus embodied that. Jesus didn't just say, love your enemy. He lived it, didn't he? He forgave those who were piercing him and putting him to death. He walked his talk. He didn't just say, whoever would be greatest among you should be the servant. He knelt and washed the feet of his disciples and humbled himself to them. And so in the consistency between what he said and what he did, people see God. People see the reflection of God in him. But the Bible says he was the first begotten of many brethren. Does that mean more messiahs coming out of the sky? No, that means you and me. Christ is the first fruits. But we are all meant to realize that. In Matthew 5, 48, Jesus proclaimed it. Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. You become the unique reflection of God. Grow to maturity and realize that. The second blessing is the establishment of a God-centered family. Jesus taught that tradition clearly in Matthew 19. The whole chapter on marriage. 
why God created us male and female and how we should then live and what it means. Love, life, and lineage were taught there. Messiah was the gift given. How can we receive that gift? The gift is meant to be received, not rejected. Would you agree? Did Jesus ever say, kill me? Did the, does the scripture ever say when the Messiah comes? When, when, does the scripture ever instruct the people to reject the Messiah? Or does it always instruct the people to receive the Messiah? Which one? Receive. To receive. And here's what Jesus said in John the 6th chapter. When they asked him, what should we do to do God's will? And Jesus said, this is the will of God, that you believe in him whom he hath sent. Who's he talking about? Himself. himself. Now let me ask you this. Was Jesus sent to the cross with people shouting, crucify him, crucify him? Was that an act of belief or disbelief? Did the people of Israel, if they had believed he was the Messiah they were waiting for, would they have ever treated him that way? No, no it was a tragic mistake because they didn't recognize it was not the intention. And that's something that's clear in the Bible. All you have to do is read it without prejudice, without indoctrination. Just read what's right there. Before Jesus came to Israel, God prepared the people for 4,000 years for what? For what? What purpose? To do what? To receive the Messiah. To accept Him. Isaiah said, every mountain should be brought down. Every valley should be filled up. Make a highway in the wilderness, a landing place. Does that sound like he's coming to crash land? So God prepared for 4,000 years, not to reject, but to receive. Very simple. Why would God do that if his intention was? He would have sent, why would God prepare a people, a specific place, and train them, and give them a tradition, and promise them that Messiah is coming, and wait, and watch, and not if he intended him to be rejected. And this is very clear in Jesus' own teaching of the parable of the vineyard. He told a parable of a vineyard and a landlord and tenants. And here's, in brief, that parable. Let me, may I tell it to you? Real quick. Matthew 21, 33 to 43. Jesus said, there was a certain landlord who owned a vineyard, and he rented his vineyard out to tenants. And when the time came to collect the rent, he sent his servants to gather the fruits in their seasons, their portion of the fruits. But the tenants rejected the servants and refused to pay. And they beat one, they threw out another, they killed another. He said. Then the landlord said, well, I will send them my son. And he said, surely if I send my son, they will respect him. Surely they will reverence my son. But when the son came to collect the rent, the tenants thought, hmm, if we kill the son, we can take the whole inheritance. And they did. They rejected him and killed him. But Jesus finished his story there. And he turned to his audience of Israelites. And he said, now, if you were that landlord, what would you do? And they answered quickly why. We would throw those tenants out. And bring in new tenants who will be respectful. We'd get rid of them if they're not paying and they're doing, treating, treating us like that, treating me like that, and we'll bring in new tenants. And Jesus surprised them by answering this. So it shall be. For the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing its fruits. Now they understood that the tenants were who? Themselves. themselves. And the landlord was who? God. And the servants were who? The prophets who had come before and were rejected one after the other. And the son was who? Jesus. Jesus himself. Not sent to be rejected, but to be reverenced and believed. Whoops. I had all that here. It's okay. I have to. Just like I told you. And similarly... The, the followers of Jesus, they, did, they, they didn't rejoice when they learned he had to go to the cross. They didn't rejoice at people's rejection. They accused the people of murdering him. Here's the first martyr in the New Testament, Stephen. And he was killed, stoned to death for these words. You stiff-necked people, unclean in your heart and your ears, you always resist God's spirit. You always resist what God wants to do. Just like your fathers killed the prophets, you are murdering 
and betraying the Son. The same as the unrighteousness of your ancestors who rejected the prophets of God, your rejection of His Son is the same unrighteousness. That's the essence of what's being said here. They condemned the people and called it betrayal and murder. Murder. The simple fact is, Jesus said, believe. God's will is that you believe. And if the people had believed, imagine what could have happened. Imagine how different things could have been. Paul called Jesus the last Adam to do what Adam was unable to do. And Paul said Adam was the figure of him who was to come, that Jesus was coming like Adam to renew the world. 